Transferring wealth successfully starts with asking yourself questions that will give your family a better life now and for generations to come. In this podcast, financial professionals John and Michael from Copper Beach Financial Group guide you through eye-opening questions to help you discover the truth about your wealth. Now, on to the show. Hello and welcome to The Truth About Wealth with John and Michael Parise of Copper Beach Financial Group. Gentlemen, how are you this morning? Doing well, Eric. How are you? Hello, Eric. Hi, Michael. Hi, John. I'm doing fantastic. I'm I'm really excited. You have brought Tim O'Rourke back to the show again. Uh, This is number three. This is the... Tim now holds the record for the most times being (laughs) a guest on the Copper Beach uh, (laughs) uh, crew here. Tim, welcome back to the show. Hey. Thanks, Eric. Appreciate it, man. Glad to be here. Yeah, absolutely. So, guys, what are you talking about today? We're going to talk a wine as usual. Um, and I, I think these podcasts can be um, uh, serious. Like we talk about serious topics. So, I think the, the wine topic is a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. So, uh, t- Tim and I enjoy really uh, spending a lot of time talking about wine in, in different regions. And the last podcast, if you listened to it, we focused on France um, and how great that region is to produce some of the finest wines in the world. And I thought today we would focus on Italy because those are the two regions that are, uh, become my favorite regions uh, for, for, you know, for the wine quality. And I, and I want Tim to take us through um, very, very powerful wine regions in Italy and maybe talk about some producers that some of the listeners might want to try um, um, along the way here. But, but Tim, I'm going to throw it to you. Um, let's talk about our wine trip to northern Italy in Piedmont. Uh, let's start in Piedmont and work our way south uh, on, on, in Italy and, and the wines they, uh, they produce. Oh, great. You know, uh, we flew into Milan, as you remember, John, uh, yes. you and Mario and I, and, and we went to uh, Piedmont. And so Piedmont is this northern region, kind of the top of the boot, if you look at the, uh, at the country of Italy. And it, uh, it's primarily the, uh, the Nebbiola grape is grown up there in a region called Barolo and Barbaresco, which are the two regions that we went to. There's 20 total primary or what I would call dominant wine regions in Italy. And um, Piedmont would be one of those. And it's it's the famous Barolo um, and Barbaresco regions that that we spent all that time in, and it was a, it was a fantastic trip to meet some of these wine producers. I mean, we went to the top wine houses at in, yeah, in, sure in that region, as you recall. Eric, real quick, I have to tell you a funny story. I was a designated driver in Italy, which you have to drive on the opposite side of the road. <laughs> Tim was my co-pilot. My brother Mario in the back was just being a royal pain. And it was it was hysterical. They were driving me crazy trying to find these, these wineries. Because they tell me I'm making wrong turns. We had a good time finding these, uh, these wineries. But to Tim's point, some of the finest wineries in the world are in that region. So uh, I, I just wanted to throw that out there. We had a lot of fun driving around. Oh, sounds like a great time. And, and I want to tell the audience something real quick. Uh, as you're listening to this podcast, please understand that um, I would be the kindergartner in this room uh, when it comes to wine. So I'm, I'm hoping that some of the audience members are joining me and learning about wine, you know, from the, kind of the start or well, that's just, what we're doing having these, a Eric. little bit. Yeah, I, yeah. Right. Michael is here and I would say he's he's in college. Right. And you two are the professors. So we're uh, obviously you're going to Italy to, for your own research to teach us. Right. I'm assuming. Yeah, Basically. Yeah, 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 sure, sure. <laughs> Eric, right. I also well, think you're giving me too much credit, I think, being a college student. Well, no, Michael so. knows Michael knows a lot no, about Michael's wine. Great. I think he's yeah, got he a great does. palate, too. Yeah, absolutely. All he right. knows what he yeah. likes, that's for sure. <laughs> teach me, gentlemen. Teach me. Let's go. <laughs> well, Eric, the main thing is just you got to drink more wine. I'm working on it. I'm working on it. I'm just waiting for that package. I know it's in here any day now. Oh, man. Brought that up again, huh? The just pack, saying. The, the, the mysterious Wait. wine that we owe you. Is that UPS? Okay. Wait, hang on. <laughs> hey, Tim, before you jump into Barbaresco and Barolo, talk about Barbera, because I think that's that's a fascinating story. That's kind of like a weed. <laughs> talk about how the farmers and the, and the northern Italians started with that particular um, um, grape. Well, a couple of the places we visited, John, as you recall, they were talking about that. They actually told us yeah. a story that Barbera's uh, was just growing wild in the fields. And so they, when they started making wine up there, you know, centuries ago, they started making that, you know, if you stayed at a hotel or whatever they, you know, they called those back then, hospice or something, 
Uh, you, you would actually get a glass of, or as much Barbera wine as you wanted. It was part of the meal, part of the, you know, if you had dinner there, you, you paid your coins you did to, to stay there, and then you got a glass of Barbera or two, or barrel, who knows, and the food included. And so it's, it's kind of grew up there. Barbera is a big, you know, fat, a powerful wine, and uh, it's uh, indigenous to that region. And it, it really evolved. Actually, Barbera has been grown there longer than anything. And so it's, uh, it's kind of been the, that, the foundation of the whole region. Yeah. yeah. But, but really, the, 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 the grape up there is Nebbiola, as you know. And that's uh, the grape or the wine of kings is what the Barolo has been known for because of its, because of its complexity, its stature. Everything about that particular grape uh, is 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 really powerful and it, uh, nebbiola is, comes from that nebbio uh, word that means fog so when we would get up in the morning sometimes john as you recall there'd be a, a fog or a mist kind of over the vineyards and that's kind of what protects the grapes from getting too much sunlight and and keeps kind of nurtures it into the day and then as the fog blends off or wears off a little bit you know the sun uh, hits those grapes a little bit more and slowly ripens it versus a, a high heat. So anytime you're looking at one of the important things is vintages, you know, that you want, you don't want to have a really warm vintage. I think in, in Northern Italy and Piedmont, it's probably a lot safer, but you don't want a real hot vintage. Like 2003 was a very hot summer, a hot fall. Those grapes tend to be a little bit more ripe and more alcohol in the, in the wine production. And so what you want to do is drink those a little earlier, where 2004 was a, a softer year, a cooler year. Uh, same with 2005. So you kind of want to stay away from those really hot summer vintages. And you can read a lot about this in Wine Spectator or different wine magazines about which vintage was warmer, which one was, which one was cooler. Yeah, Tim, talk about the difference of Barbaresco and Barolo, because I always found that fascinating. Yeah, so it's a it's a microclimate difference, John. If if you remember how it kind of went down into a valley, into where it changed into Barbaresco versus Barolo, and uh, the soil content is a little different, it's a little sandier. But it's the same grape, correct? Excuse me, I'm sorry. Same, same grape, grape. Yeah. yeah, same grape, Nebbiola. So uh, it it and it's a different marketing kind of place, kind of like uh, when you go to Tuscany. There's uh, Chiani Classico, which is a region, right, that we're going to talk about in a, in a little bit. And, and when you're in that map, in that actual land region, then you can only call yourself Chiani Classico if you qualify, if you do certain things, if the vineyards are certain uh, sun-facing and, and you, you age the wine in oak barrels for so long and so long in a bottle before release. So there's very stipulations and regulations that, that govern these regions that, that uh, in order to use that brand name like Barolo or Barbaresco. So Barbaresco is a little bit less, um, it's kind of like the baby sister of that region compared to Barolo. Barolo is a much bigger wine producing area where Barbaresco is a smaller region using the same grape as you said, but they don't. They have to age it a year less, and so they they release a little earlier. They're a little bit younger drinking, but they're fascinating because of the different um, profile that Nebbiola grows uh, in, in that little subregion. Now, how long do they both have to age? You want to walk everybody through the process of aging? Yeah, three years in Barbaresco and four in Barolo. Then, when you get to the uh, Reserva level, it goes up a year usually in the bottle. And, and also the quality. Uh, when you get to a reserve, they're trying to put out a, you know, they try to handpick the grapes out of the, the picking that they think are the riper ones or the, or the better ones. And then they're able to make a, uh, you know, higher quality reserva kind of wine. When you talk about um, <clears throat> when you should drink the wine, and I, 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 we, we didn't talk about this in France particularly, but because I was, I was w in Italy with you, we spent a lot right. of time talking to the producers about uh, when a wine is bottled, how long how long does it take for you, that wine to mature? And I think there was a 10-year time horizon. Am I mistaken? It was 10 years before wine hits its peak where it's at the top level of that, of that grape. Is that, is, is, that the, is that the fact pattern? 
Yeah, pretty much. I think that's up to yeah, everybody has a different opinion. You know, when we met with Giacomo Conterno, remember at his winery, he was talking about oh, it's beautiful, he prefers right? 15 years. <laughs> yeah. Of course, you know, they go down and pull a bottle out right out of the cellar. It's a little different from you and I, but um, yeah, there, m- most likely I would say anywhere from eight to 10 years is a good point in Barolo or Barbaresco. You can start drinking them a little younger. But I would say eight to ten years in Barolo for me anyway. I like them ten to twelve years even. You and I had a a twelve year old. What well, was a two thousand twelve Flacinello? Uh, the last time we were together, that was eight years old. That was really still too young. But it was awesome. <laughs> oh, it was good. <laughs> yeah. So so if, so if I was going to go into a, a a liquor store or a wine store and, and wanted to buy a Barolo or a Barbaresco. And it had 2010 on the label. That's probably the 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 peak of that wine. I should probably buy that. But I'm but it's probably a little pricier. Am I am I am I right about that? Because it's yeah, like, it's going to cost you a little bit more. So the older they are, the the more pricier potentially. Yeah, but yeah, you know it's hard to buy a 2010 right now. You can go to the internet. One of the services yeah. I like to use is called Wine Searcher, and you can load that app on your on your uh, cell phone. I use it all the time, yeah. Yeah, and you put in the, you know, maybe a region, just put in Barolo and I'll tell you, um, give you a, a wide spew of different possibilities of where you could buy that wine around the United States. But uh, generally speaking, you're not going to find a lot of 2010. So in a good year like 2010, it's, uh, let's see, 2016 is uh, the one that I would tell everybody to buy in Italy right now. I think throughout I, I all did. of Italy and France, yeah, yeah, 2016 is going to be a great year to to buy some wine and and store it. You know, put it away for a few years and start drinking again three for three to four years from now. All right, let's move further south, uh, Italy. So the next region that we would talk but, about. But wait, before we leave there, okay, I, I want to focus on a couple producers that I particularly okay. like, and it, and it depends on your. Obviously, your your financial situation, but uh, Bruno Giacosa, who did pass away recently, but the Giacosa name up there is like one of the top ones, along with Gaia. Um, those are those are the high level producers that you, you're going to pay a lot of money for, but they make unbelievable wines. So uh, Giacosa wines, Gaia wines, those those are the kind of the top of the heap. If you want to try something more. Let's say higher quality but affordable. You might want to try a Clerico. That's uh, Domenico Clerico, who Domenico passed away a couple of years ago as well. And somebody that I met a couple of times, and he was uh, basically a, a great farmer. You know, the great wine producers are are good in the field. They always say great wines are made in the field. So uh, Domenico Clerico is a good one. Um, I think that La Spinetta, you and I went, uh, and Mario went to visit La Spinetta Giorgio. over there. <laughs> Giorgio. And had one of the lunches of our lifetime, as Mario said. <laughs> Six we, hours we were of, in high of cotton. drinking and talking. Yeah, we were, we were in high cotton. <laughs> yeah, fascinating. Fascinating. Yeah, so, yeah. so uh, and, and then from there, there's a lot of little producers in Barolo and, and uh, Barbaresco, you know, that you, you can pick up for. Fifty, sixty dollars a bottle that are, are fantastic wines that you open up and let them breathe for an hour, maybe before your dinner, and uh, I, I think you would be, you know, really impressed with uh, the level of wine. But when you're talking about the Giacosas and and also the Giacosas and Gaias, you're probably talking about two hundred to five hundred dollars a bottle type of stuff, Ouch. where you can get in the Iliola Ataris and. And some of the, uh, even even Giacomo Conterno or Aldo Conterno, where we spent some time, you know, those wines are still going to be up around 100 to 160 bucks a bottle, um, which I would classify as a, a higher crew level, you know, a better wine. How about the Barbaresco Mugagato? I bought a case back. That's really, really good wine. That's priced reasonably. Yeah, I think it's around 55, 60 bucks a bottle, yeah, you know. And it's really, really And good. you can pick up some mags for, you know, one hundred twenty dollars a bottle. Mags are great for parties and uh, family events or bigger entertaining kind of things. It's always fun to pull out a mag. I think. Or in your case, yeah, a we, double mag. That what, what did you just get? That Flacinello and a double mag. Double mag, yeah. 
Ouch. <laughs> It was, it's going to be good, though. That's for sure. Uh, all right, let's Michael's going to get some of that, I think. Uh, here, yeah, he already has a bottle. It's about time. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so let's let's drift down to to, to the next region, and, I, and Tuscany rings rings a bell to me. Um, sure. Is there a region before Tuscany that you might want to uh, talk about that uh, that has some interesting wine? Umbria has some interesting wines. That's kind of near Tuscany. It's kind of central. Again, Umbria and Tuscany are kind of the more popular regions, and, and they're going to grow uh, the Monte, Monte um, they're, they're, they're Merlots grown there. You know, a lot of grapes have been, or varietals have been introduced into both Tuscany and Umbria that are what they call super Tuscans, or they're not the traditional Sangiovese. Sangiovese is the indigenous grape there to that region, and and so you, a lot of the wines are based on Sangiovese-based kind of uh, yeah, either 100% or right. higher blend. Oh, yeah. Right. But, yeah. but, but, but that's, a, that's a real central kind of Italy uh, area that the Umbria and Tuscany both are. You know, everybody wants to travel to Tuscany if you get a chance. If you haven't yeah. been there, you need to go see it. It really is a fascinating place. Yeah, we'll be there in June, hopefully. Hopefully. Knock on yeah. wood. The Va Policella, uh wine is one of my favorite. Um, talk about that that particular wine along with the other ones. Is that is because that's I love that wine. That's one of my favorite in that region. Yeah, so so Valpolicella is uh, is really a different region. It's grown. It's uh, it's like it, it's a big, powerful wine. A lot of times, what they'll do is they'll pick those and dry them out a little bit to give it a, a drier characteristic where. The wines are um, also Amarone, which is they actually take the grapes after picking and lay them out on, on these mats in order to dry some of the moisture out of them. So it makes a much more concentrated wine with a lot more flavor and uh, big, powerful wines as well. I think they go yeah, with a lot of heavy meats powerful. and yeah. Yeah, stuff like that. But yeah, I mean, Valpolicella. I think if you're going to have a big red sauce, you know, for a meal or something, you want you might want to look at some of those producers in there that make some good Valpolicella. You can get it under a hundred dollars. That they're really good wines too, very affordable. Yeah, I know when you, when you talk about fifty hundred dollars bottles of wine, a lot a lot of the listeners probably say, "Well, I, I really can't afford that 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 level of wine." Um, but I know you and I both know there are some good quality wines for twenty to thirty dollars. That yep. are smaller producers that are from that region that they could try. I, w- I would probably recommend them to uh, pick up wine wine spectator or or some a wine uh, book and and do your own research because you could probably find or a wine searcher you could probably find some really good quality uh, wines for twenty thirty bucks a bottle. That's that's more appealing to, s- to some people. But but you're right there. You start getting to the uh, hundred dollar bottle of wines. There's a there's a massive difference from my standpoint. On the, on yeah, the let's talk. Let's talk about Brunello because uh, Michael, yeah. I think that's your favorite region, as as we talked about before. Mm-hmm. I do. I like a lot of. I like the Super Tuscans. I do like the Valpolicellas and and Brunellos. I like as well. So yeah, I, I I like my Italian wines for sure. Well, you uh, you fit the profile, my my man. <laughs> <laughs> it's in my blood. It's in your blood. Can't help it. You know. Um, so when, when you think about Brunello, right, it's, it's still the Sangiovese grape, but it's a different clone. So it's a little thicker skinned grape that has more structure to it. And so when they make wine in Brunello de Montecino, it is a, um, it's a it's, so it's a different grape that they've cultivated there. And they, when they go in and crush that grape and they keep what they call the, the, the grape skins on the lees, longer it makes a a powerful wine compared to a Chiani Classico which is a completely different profile and I think there's last my last trip there there are 260 wine producers in um, Brunello in that little region and it surrounds the town so it's this hill that goes all the way up to a peak of the town where the town is on top and as you can imagine they've got a wall around that town an old wall built about four or 500 years ago, 600 years ago, some cases that protected, you know, the, the, the people who lived in the community from the bandits because they didn't have a lot of uh, military back then or police. And so each of these towns had to pr- learn how to protect themselves and they had their own kind of 
you know, militia. And so that particular region, because of the soil and everything, um, they, they grow a different brand, you know, much like we were talking about on our last podcast about Italy and the Barbaresco and the Barolo regions. Uh, it is, it's a different wine kind of area there that, uh, that, that they market, you know, under the Brunello flag. And so they have regulations a certain um, at times they have to keep it on, um, on the, the wood, you know, in the, in the barrels and then certain amount of time in the, in the bottle and then only south facing uh, uh, kind of land, you know, where the, the vineyards are, John, like we talked about up in right. Barolo is in order to be called Barolo, you have to have mostly south facing land there. And, and then um, you, you have to abide by all these different regulations and, you can only produce so much wine per hectare. Again, a hectare is 2.2 acres. So they, they control the quality and the quantity of wine produced. Yeah, I, I, I found that fascinating. They do really pay attention to that because they don't want to overproduce and they don't want to let the cat out of the bag. They want the quality of wine to stay, stay at the highest quality from those regions. And, and I, I agree with that. I mean, I think it's, a, it's important to recognize that that's an important part of keeping the wine consistent at a quality level. Um, I, I still believe, and, and again, you and I, I think, agree, that the, the more you let that wine open in a decanter or just leave that bottle open, the better the wine, the smoother it gets. Most people drink wine too quickly, particularly the Italians and, and the Brunello, particularly. You got to let that, that bottle breathe. You have to open it at least an hour before you want to drink it. Um, now, if you want to go to your... If you have a local restaurant, if it's still open, if you want to go to your local restaurant um, and you know the, their wine list, you could you should order your, your wine ahead of time and tell them to open it so when you arrive at the restaurant, you could be ready to go when you order your dinner, your wine's ready to, because <clears throat> it had time to breathe. So that, that's a little trick that I learned years ago. That's, that's what you should do to let these wines really uh, um, you know, make them enjoyable. Yep, absolutely. And, and, you know, some wineries that you might want to try if, if – if uh, somebody's out there listening to, uh, you know, to, to drink with some good hearty kind of red food, you know, like a red sauce or uh, even even some of the uh, seafood kind of dishes with uh, a heartier flavor are going to do well would be like an Altacino. That's a very popular Brunello brand. I think, Michael, you probably had some Altacino. Um, I think so, yeah. Ar- Argiano, yeah. that's A-R-G-I-A-N-O, makes yeah, a great that. one. Yeah. Uh, Avignasi. So there's, you know, Castello, Bonfi. Bonfi is a very popular one. Uh, Castello de Ama. These are some really good producers that that you, you could buy easily. And, and of course, one of the most popular families, uh, wine producing families there since, since about the 1500s is the Antonori family. And they grow an incredible amount of wine through all kinds of levels. An that, enormous family. <laughs> yeah. They're, Amazing, they're enormous, and and one of their one of the best wines that uh, this is, this is a good story is is Macedo. I don't know if anybody realizes, but uh, Macedo is a hundred percent Merlot, and it's grown by the Antonori family in a very exclusive little vineyard that that they've been manicuring and taking care of the, through the centuries. Uh, Macedo, when the when the Mandavi sold their winery, I think it was about 10, 12 years ago, they were asked, did you keep any of your Mandavi wines? And I think we've all had some really good Mandavi wines out of California, the Napa area, for, for many, many years. And they, and they really did produce a great cab uh, and, and also some blended wines. But the, the one thing that they said is, yeah, we, we kept some of our own wine, but we kept all the Macedo that we had collected over the years. <laughs> <laughs> so, Macedo is a is is right now probably around five hundred dollars a bottle on release, and wow. um, it's it's really one of the most amazing uh, Merlot based wines that you'll ever ever get to try if you ever get a chance and can afford that level of wine. I, I'd highly recommend it, buying a couple bottles and trying it. Let's talk a little bit about Chianti. I know that that's a, one of your favorites as well as mine. You want, want to talk a little bit about that that particular wine? Sure. So, so Chiani really is a, again another region, right? It's it's not like it's not like a, a wine or a grape 
it is a region, a marketing group. So in Kiani, they actually uh, have classified Kiani Classico in a land mass, you know, so it has boundaries and everything. And inside that, you have to use um, the, the Kiani grape, which is uh, Sangiovese, and, uh, which is the primary grape in all of Italy, I think. Nebbiola, Sangiovese, Barbera, uh, Nero de Avila, uh, the, these are the primary ones, Val, Valpolicella blends, you know, but those are the main grapes in that, in, in Italy, and Sangiovese is the main grape in Tuscany. And so you have to follow those guidelines. And Chiani Classico, I think, is is a great expression. And if you follow the food, John, in that region, you're going to see that those wines, uh, the food was really made around those wines because they, the, the acid in the wine really goes with a red sauce. So if you're going to have like a, um, a homemade uh, red sauce and a spaghetti or something at night or or maybe a brochola, uh, what, what's the one that you made the other day? Um, brajola, yeah. We made yeah, brajola. brajola. Yeah, the, the brajola would, you know, a Chiani Classico would be a great choice uh, w- w- with that. And, and it has such a history, too. And so what you're looking for is, um, you know, producers that have that, I think it's got that black, cock chicken on the label i mean on the bottle cap and that's that's their brand is uh, is when and whenever you see that kind of uh, a sign on the bottle that that will tell you from that Kiani Kiani classical region yeah i remember my grandfather used to buy it by the gallons <laughs> i think it was, what, the, it was the a classico? little cheaper but yeah we, it was, it was, but he used to, he loved, that's all he drank for, for years. So that's, a, that's the wine I kind of grew up with being Italian. Um, but, but, you know, the whole idea of how diverse the wine business is in Italy and the quality of the grapes and the wines, it's, it fascinates me because, and, and you helped me through that, Tim, because I was more of a, a, a U.S. California cab wine guy. I, that's, that's the wine I drank a lot of, and I still love a good bottle of Cabernet. But when you really when you really look at Italy and France, as we talked on the last podcast, these are regions that if you haven't tried these wines, you really have to really read about them and try them. And, and to your point, the matching of the food uh, with Italian wines, you, you have so much diversity to do to, to match foods with some of those greatest wines. It's amazing. I mean, and it changes the flavor of the wine. It changes the meal itself, and it's dynamic. It, it really is. See, I love Cab, but Cab, is, it'll, it'll kick your butt. It's strong stuff, and you have to have that with a certain kind of food. You can't. You, I don't think you drink cab with cheese and crackers, but you could do that with a you know Barolo or or a Barbaresco and get away with it and, and enjoy it. So that I, I just think the Italian wines are, are have become my favorite, not because I'm Italian, because of the quality and the diversity in, in that particular region. I mean, I could be wrong, but but that's 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 my take. Now I know you we know, talked about. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say that they've. Um, Sangiovese obviously is um, is that's the grape of that heartland, you know, the central kind of uh, Italy area. And so what what it's done is they've that's tr- the traditional grape that they've always grown. And I, and I think back in the I don't know in the early 1900s they started introducing the Cabernet Sauvignon, and the Merlot grape into that region. And that's kind of what inspired what is called today the Super Tuscans, you know, Super yeah. Chianis, basically. So they, a lot of them still kept that Sangiovese base grape in the blend, but they started adding Cabernet and Merlot and a couple other varietals into there in, uh, in order to make a whole different profile, but stay with that, stay with that Sangiovese base. And so I think a lot of people, if, if you're interested in learning more about Central Italy wines, you want to try some of these. These Super Tuscans yeah, are agree. really amazing. They're fabulous. Yeah, they're really, really good. Yeah, and, and a completely different profile. But back to your whole point, John, about, about Chiani Classico. I mean, that really is the traditional wine-growing region in Central Italy uh, where we're going to go next year and, and go visit uh, the, some of the Tuscany wineries. And I think you're going to find that they they actually blend um, some other grapes into that uh, into those Chianti Classicos, a uh, couple that you wouldn't even know. Most it's a white wine actually is blended into Chianti Classico. So 
you know, they have different requirements or different ways you can make it. You can make it all Sangiovese or you can blend in a couple other ones that are allowed because of their, they're from that region. But it's, it's really changing, I think, is the, the, the storyline in central, um, in central part of Italy there in Tuscany is they're allowing now that, you know, this and it's more Cabernet Merlot based kind of stuff. And sometimes they're even just doing a blend of Cab and Merlot, or like I said earlier with that, uh, with 100% Merlot wine, uh, they're starting to allow different things grown there and, and, and being able to market under different brands. Hey, Tim, this may be an oddball question from a region standpoint. What about Sicily? Sicily's really interesting, Michael. That's a great, great question. Uh, you know, further south, obviously, um, it, it's... It, they, they have regions there within that climate that, you know, they, they date back thousands of years uh, B.C., and it's a warmer, drier climate climate there. And um, uh, some of the grapes grown there are going to be hardier, bigger. Ava de, Nero de Avalo, I think, is one of them grown there. Okay. And then they're saying that different varietals have really – uh, kind of been, you know, cultivated there, and and the wines are going to be bigger. I think the what's the what's the food like there, John, compared to other parts of Italy? It's going to be a a richer food, isn't it? Yeah, it's more of a, a, a heavier. The, the sauces are heavier. The the meals are heavier. We're in North you get a lot of fish, a lot of white sauces, but down south south it's heavier. It's heavier um, food. Yeah, and, and they've got a lot of grape varietals, Mike, that, that you probably have never heard of that are popular down there. I, I, I mean, remember the last time I was in, in Georgia with you, we had dinner at Tim's house, the other Tim, and he had a beautiful wine cellar. And we pulled out a couple bottles of Sicilian wine. And I, I, I love the one he picked. I can't remember the name of it, but it was very minerally to me. But it was very powerful. And you, you didn't quite like that, if I recall. And Tim no, gave you a not, hard time. not my kind of style. No. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm being sensitive to Tim, Sicily's not Tim's favorite region. I happen to like the wine I had. So there are some good, I, I guess the bottom line, in every region of the world, there's, there's probably a, a good bottle of wine that someone hasn't tried yet. And again, t- to my point, you, you got to try it. You have to research it. Uh, you have to develop a, a, a concept about where you want to um, develop your palate. Um, like chili is another one. I mean, you and I both love this, 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 the Spanish wines and the Portugal wines. Uh, we'll talk about the, the, the you know, next podcast that we do because they're, they're one of my favorites. So, so the, I, I think the messaging of this is there's so many different great wines out there. Don't get stuck in only drinking one. And, and again, to, you, to your point way back when, when we first started talking about wines years ago, is that you said that you could spend a $125 bottle on a good cab in California and buy three bottles of a good Barolo. So, so, they're, so, so it's not as expensive as some of the higher-end cabs. So you get some real good bargains um, in, in these regions as well. So I, I challenge anybody listening to this podcast, try it. Don't be afraid of it. Read about it. Um, you, your palate's your palate. Uh, to Michael, as an example... I turned Michael on the Barolo first, and when he drank Bar- you know, Brunello after that, he, he built a palate for Brunello, and he likes that wine. He likes to drink the Vapalicellas. It's just a, a bigger wine. Brunello is a nice classic soft wine, which I have a tendency to like. So really, try different wines, and I think you could, uh, you could learn a lot about uh, what you like and what you don't like, and then you can build your wine cellar. Like I did. You know, I, I still drink Cabernet wines all the time and blended oh, I know caps. You, you, you know, still got some good ones in your cellar, I remember. Yeah. And, and I like it for certain things. Yeah. But as you, I mean, your point is well taken that as you, as you expand your kind of interest in wine and food, I think they all come together, don't they really? I mean, we're, we're constantly looking for, um, I, I, I believe anyway, is to enhance our food, right? And, 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 and I love to cook and you love to cook. Michael's a cook. I mean, uh, it's so much fun to get a family together, especially with the whole COVID thing that hit us. You know, it's I think we've had more time to spend in the kitchen with each other. And also 
than to pull stuff out of your wine cellar. I mean, this is something that could be more than a hobby, as, as we talked about. It could be an investment thing. And it could be just a fun thing that we learn more about. It's, it's like we're just talking about Sicily. You know, Marsala wine comes from Sicily. You cook with Marsala, but they also make some Marsala that is very drinkable, that you could, you could have with a meal, you know. And th- so, so there's wines from all over the, the, the world that I think open up your, your, all the possibilities, you know. That, so we talked about California, obviously, is one of the, you know, it's the fourth largest wine producing uh, area in the world, country in the world. Uh, but when you look at Italy and France, I mean, those two alone make... I think something like seven or eight times more wine than all of the United States put together. Yeah, that's so, that's, that's a lot. Yeah, that's, yeah I mean, that's there, there's a lot of wine out there from uh, just from Italy and France alone. And then we'll talk about Spain another time. I don't think we have the time to go into that. And um, so, so I would encourage everybody to try uh, some Sangiovese grown out of uh, central Italy, which is the Tuscany or Umbria area. And then also encourage you to try some Nebbiola. Just don't tell anybody about Nebbiola and Barolo. Yeah, you have to keep that quiet, right? You got to keep a secret here. (laughs) Keep a secret, or people will buy a lot of it. We want to keep it. We want to keep it private to us. That's right. A funny story before we we end. We don't want to happen what uh, (laughs) goes on in Bordeaux and Burgundy, you know, where you can't afford it anymore. A, a, A funny story. I was I was at my daughter Alicia's uh, house a couple weeks ago, and I see a wine book. On her coffee table, she bought a wine book. You spoiled, you killed my daughter. <laughs> She's looking at the buying the Mont Rocher. She loves the white Mont Rocher, which is kind of expensive. But, but anyway, I love, so I love st- Michael's wedding. Yeah. <laughs> Michael, you remember your wedding when yeah, your dad was, bought actually, all that wine, and, were, and the girls are going nuts up. over the white Burgundy. <laughs> yeah, well, I was I was going to say I think I, I don't know if it was a Barolo or Brunello that we had. I don't know because I didn't have any of it because by the time I was finished saying hello to everybody, I asked for a glass and the uh, waiter, I guess, says, oh, no, that's all gone. And then they pointed over at your <laughs> It was a Barolo, too. yeah. <laughs> it was a Barolo, I remember. So hey, I'm, listen, Tim. I'm we're, glad we're, you enjoyed it. <laughs> Tim, we're running short on time. Anyway, I wanted to thank you again, Tim, for uh, for your expertise. And uh, and I, I think these podcasts can be fun, and I think hopefully everyone enjoyed this one. on. But also, it's also very educational. I think I think wine's a fascinating uh, product, uh, or it, it, you know, something you could really sink your teeth into and enjoy reading about and drinking along the way. Um, so, with that said, Tim, thanks very much again for your time, and um, and uh, let's uh, let's get the next one for Spain and Portugal. How's that? Sounds great. All right, guys, All right, thanks. En- enjoyed it. Bye bye. Again, this has been fantastic. I'm still trying to figure out how exactly to spell Nebbiola, even though we're not supposed to talk about it. Um, but maybe anyway. <laughs> so, there's so Two many Bs, good... Eric. Two Bs. Yeah, Two got Bs. It. Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, this has been fantastic. Again, I love the fact that you, well, obviously you're providing a tremendous education on wine, but you're, you're really giving a lot of options for any any person to get into it uh, at, at reasonable rates to be able to try and find out what they like first and then when they do find the the type of wine in the region and the type of grape and all that jazz, then they can, you know, step up to that hundred dollar bottle of wine that you're talking about, John, and, and really uh, treat themselves. So I think it's fantastic. I appreciate the time that you guys spend educating all of us, uh, especially me and the, any audience members that are in my kindergarten category. Okay. <laughs> and I just want to thank you so much for all the time that you spent with us today. Uh, hey, my pleasure. pleasure. Really enjoyed it. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, last thank you goes to the listening audience. Thank you so much for tuning in and listening to the Truth About Wealth podcast with John and Michael Paris. If you have not subscribed to the podcast yet, please click the subscribe now button below. This way, when John and Michael come out with a new podcast, it'll show up directly on your listening device. This also makes it much easier to share these podcasts with your friends and family. And I'm going to challenge you as a listening audience. I know John and Michael are always interested in what you think and what you want to learn about. Uh, it doesn't always have to be a hardcore subject and, and very, very technical. It can be about wine. It can be about other things as well. So please reach out to the team, email them, and let them know what you want to learn about because I'm pretty sure they'll be open to some suggestions. Again, thank you so much for listening today. For everyone at Copper Beach Financial Group, this is Eric Johnson reminding you to live your best day every day, and we'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to the Truth About Wealth podcast. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest 
and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of Copper Beach Financial Group. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning. This material is for informational purposes only. Neither APFS nor its representatives provide tax, legal, or accounting advice. Please consult your own tax, legal, or accounting professional before making any decisions. Copper Beach is not affiliated with American Portfolios Financial Services, Inc. and American Portfolios Advisors, Inc. Securities offered through American Portfolio Financial Services, Inc., a member of FINRA SIPC, Investment Advisory and Financial Planning Services offered through American Portfolio Advisors, Inc., an SCC Registered Investment Advisor. These opinions are subject to change at any time without notice. Any comments or postings are provided for informational purposes only and do not constitute an offer or a recommendation to buy or sell securities or other financial instruments. Readers should conduct their own review and exercise judgment prior to investing. Investments are not guaranteed, involve risk, and may result in a loss of principal. Past performance does not guarantee future results. Investments are not suitable for all type of investors. Copper Beach is an unaffiliated entity of American Portfolios Financial Services, Inc. and American Portfolios Advisors, Inc. Any opinion expressed in this forum is not the opinions of American Portfolio Financial Services, Inc. and American Portfolio Advisors, Inc. and have not been reviewed by the firm for completeness or accuracy.